I would like to welcome to the stage our speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, speaking on the subject, the Quran and modern science, compatible or incompatible. I would like to give you now a brief introduction of Dr. Zakir Naik, and truly it is a brief introduction because there is too much to be said. He is a medical doctor by professional training and a renowned dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation in Mumbai and clarifies Islamic viewpoints, clearing misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He has completed all of this study in preparation by the age now of 41, still young, but Sheikh. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 10 years, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,000 public talks in the United States of America, Canada, the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, and South America, and many other countries, in addition to numerous public talks here in India. He has successfully participated in several symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell from the United States of America on the topic, the Quran, the Bible, and the light of science was held in Chicago, the United States of America in April of 2000 and was a resounding success by the grace of Allah. Sheikh Ahmed Didat, the world famous orator on Islam and comparative religion who had called Dr. Zakir Naik Didat Plus in 1994, presented a plaque in May of 2000 with the engraving awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik for his achievement in the field of Dawah and the study of comparative religion. Son, what you have done in four years had taken me 40 years to accomplish, alhamdulillah, to end the quote of Ahmed Didat. Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on many international television channels in more than 200 countries of the world. He is regularly invited to TV and radio interviews. More than 100 of his talks, dialogues, debates, and symposia are available on DVDs, VCDs, video cassettes, audio cassettes, and he has authored several books on Islam and comparative religion. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Zakir Naik, President of the Islamic Research Foundation. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajma'in amma abad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Awalam yara lazina kafiru. Anna samawati wal arda. Kana taratkan uftakna huma. Waja'alna minal ma'i kulla shayin hai. Afala yuminun. Rabbi shayli sadri. Wa yassilli amri. 
واهل العقده من لسان يفكو قولي my respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of almighty god be on all of you the topic of this evening's talk of mine is the quran and modern science compatible or incompatible the glorious quran is the last and final revelation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of almighty god which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him for any book to claim that it is the word of god for any book to claim that it is the revelation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it should stand the test of time previously hundreds and thousands of years back it was the age of miracles and alhamdulillah the glorious quran is the miracle of miracles later on more than 1000 years back it was the age of literature and poetry when the quran was revealed and alhamdulillah muslims and non muslim scholars alike they claim the glorious quran to be the best arabic literature available on the face of the earth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the challenge of the glorious Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 23 and 24 which says wa in kuntum fi raib mimma nazzalna al abdana and if you end out as what we have revealed to our servant prophet muhammad peace be upon him from time to time fatu bi surat mim misli then produce a surah somewhat similar to it wad u shuhada aqum min dunillah in kuntum sadiqin and call forth your helpers and witnesses if there are any besides allah if your doubts are but true fa in lam taf'alu and if you cannot wa lam taf'alu and of a surety you cannot fattakun nar allati waquduha an-nas li jara uddat al-kafirin then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones which is prepared for those who reject faith here the quran gives a challenge they try and produce a surah somewhat similar to it and the shortest surah is hardly three verses hardly few words no one has done it so far and no one inshallah till eternity will ever be able to do it but today suppose a religious scripture in a very poetic fashion says that the world is flat will a modern man believe in it but natural no because today is not the age of literature and poetry today is the age of science and technology so let us analyze today whether this glorious quran is compatible or incompatible to modern science whether does it pass the test of today the test of modern science according to albert einstein the famous physicist and the nobel prize winner he said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind let me repeat it that albert einstein the famous physicist and the nobel prize winner said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind let me remind you that the glorious quran is not a book of science s c i e n c e but it is a book of signs s i g n s it's a book of ayats and there are more than 6000 ayats 6000 signs in the glorious quran out of which more than 1000 speak about science as far as my talk today is concerned I will only be speaking about scientific facts which have been established. I will not be speaking about scientific theories and hypotheses which all of us know very well that many a time these theories and hypotheses they take U-turns. In the field of astronomy in 1973 there were a couple of scientists 
who got the Nobel Prize. And these couple of scientists, they described the creation of the universe. And they called it the Big Bang. And they said that initially, our universe, it was a primary nebula. Then there was a Big Bang. There was a secondary separation, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, the moon, and the earth on which we live. This they call as the Big Bang. The glorious Quran mentions this in a nutshell. 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, the ayah I started my talk with. And it says, Awalam yaral lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda ka that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This verse of the glorious Quran speaks about the Big Bang in a nutshell 1400 years ago, which science has discovered recently. Hardly 30 years back, 35 years back. The glorious Quran says in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 11. Moreover, he comprehended in his design the sky when it was smoke and said to it, and the earth, come ye together willingly or unwillingly, and they said, we come in willing obedience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he said to the sky when it was smoke, come ye together along with the earth willingly or unwillingly, and they said, we come together in willing obedience. Today, the scientists, they tell us that initially the celestial matter of the universe, it was in the form of gas. And the Arabic word used in this verse of Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 11, is Dukhan. Dukhan does not merely mean gas, it specifically means smoke. And today scientists say that smoke is a more closer and more scientific as compared to gas, because that time it was hot. Imagine, the Quran mentions 14 years ago, which we discovered recently, that the initial celestial matter of the universe, it was in the form of smoke. Previously, the human beings, we thought that the earth on which we live, it is flat. It was in 1577, Sir Francis Drake, when he sailed around the earth, he proved that the earth was spherical. Quran mentions in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 29, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who merges the night into day and merges the day into night. Alam tara anna laha yuliju layla fin nahari wa yuliju nahara fin layli. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who merges the night into the day and merges the day into the night. Merging is a gradual and slow process. The night slowly and gradually merges into the day and the day slowly and gradually merges into the night. If the earth was flat, there would have been a sudden change. It wouldn't have been a gradual process of night merging into the day and day merging into the night. Allah gives a similar message in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 5. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who overlaps the night unto the day and overlaps the day unto the night. The Arabic word used here is kawara, which means to overlap or coil. So the Quran says it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who overlaps or coils the night unto the day and overlaps or coils the day unto the night. Coiling the word kawara is used, how you coil a turban unto your head. So this overlapping and coiling of the night unto the day and the day unto the night is only possible if the shape of the earth was spherical. If it was flat, it was not possible. And Allah further says in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, we have made the earth as an expanse and we have made the earth X-shaped. Wal ard baada zalika dahaha. Wal ard means, and then we made the earth X shaped. One of the meanings of dahaha is an expanse. And the other meaning of the Arabic word dahaha, it is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know today that the earth on which we live is not completely round like a ball. 
it is geospherical in shape. It is flattened from the pole and it is bulging from the center. And the Arabic word duya doesn't mean a normal egg. It specifically means the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, it too is geospherical in shape. Imagine the glorious Quran mentions 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical. It does not say spherical only, it specifically mentions like the egg of an ostrich. Previously, the scientists, they thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has made the constellations in the sky and placed therein sun, that is a lamp, having its own light, and moon, having borrowed light. The Arabic word used for the sun in the Quran, it is shams. And its light is always described as siraj, wahaj, or diya, which means a torch having a light of its own, or a blazing lamp, or a shining glory. Always the light of the sun is described as wahaj, siraj, or diya, meaning a light of its own. The Arabic word for moon is kamar, and its light is described as munir or nur, meaning borrowed light or a reflected light. There is not a single place in the Quran where the light of the moon is described as its own light. And the Arabic word for star is najam, and its light is described as sakib, meaning the light, by the time it reaches the earth, it loses its brightness, like a piercing brightness. The bright light, by the time it reaches, it consumes itself. And this message, that the sun has its own light, describing as wahaj, siraj, or diya, and the moon having borrowed light, that is munir, or reflection of nur, is mentioned in several places in the Quran, including Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 5, as well as Surah Nuh, chapter number 71, verse number 15 and 16. And the Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 3, that what Najmus Saqib, describing the star, its light as Saqib, that means it pierces, it's of piercing darkness. Previously, the European scientists, they believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system and the universe. And all the planets, as well as the moon and the sun, it revolved around the Earth. This was called as geocentrism. And this was believed since the time of Ptolemy in the second century BC till as late as 16th century, until Nicholas Copernicus in 1512, he propounded the heliocentric theory of the planetary motion. And he said, it is the sun which is the center of the solar system. And all the planets, as well as the Earth, it revolves around the sun. And later on, a German scientist by the name of Johannes Kepler, in 1609, he wrote in his book by the name Astronomia Novia, that not only do the planets and the Earth, they revolve around the sun, but they also rotate about their own axis. And when I was in school, I passed my school in 1982, about more than 25 years back. There I too read that the planets and the Earth, they revolve around the sun, and the planets and the Earth, they rotated about their own axis. And the whole solar system, also in the galaxy it revolved, including the sun, but the sun did not rotate about its own axis. In this context, the sun was stationary. But when I read the verse of the Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, which says, Huwallazi khalaqal layla nahar. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Washamsa wal kamar. 
the sun and the moon. Kullun fi falaki yasbuhun, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. So the Quran says, the sun and the moon, besides revolving, they also rotate about their own axis. The Arabic word used here is yasbuhun, derived from the Arabic word sabaha, which describes the motion of a moving body. If I use this Arabic word yasbaha for a person who's moving on the floor, it will not mean that he's rolling, it will mean he's either walking or running. If I use the same word for a person in the water, it will not mean he's floating, it will mean he's swimming. Similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the same word for a celestial body, it does not mean that it is flying in the air, it means it is moving along with its own rotation. It's rotating about its own axis. So Quran says the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it also rotates about its own axis. And today, science has discovered that even the sun rotates. Since we can't see the sun directly, you get blinded if you see directly. If you have an equipment and have the image of the sun on a tabletop, we find that there are spots in the sun. And it takes about 25 days for the spots to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. Imagine when I was in school, I was taught the sun was stationary, didn't rotate about its own axis, and the Quran mentioned 14 years ago that it rotates. And now, alhamdulillah, most of the schools have incorporated that the sun also rotates. Further, we read in the Quran. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 40. It is not permitted for the sun to overtake the moon, nor the night to outstrip the day. The moon and the sun. Kullun fi falaki yasbuhun. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. Now the scientists say that the orbit of the sun and the moon is different. So there's no question of the sun overtaking the moon. That's what the Quran says. And today the scientists, they tell us, that the sun is moving in a direction in the universe to a particular fixed direction which is called as the solar apex in the constellation of Hercules also known as Alpha Lyra at a speed of 12 miles per second and today the scientists they tell us that the sunlight we have is due to a chemical reaction which is taking place since billions of years and one day, this chemical reaction will cease. And so will the light of the sun cease to exist. And so will the life on this earth cease to exist. But the scientists say it will take another few billion years. Quran gives a similar message in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 38. mustaqar That the sun is running its course for a period determined, to a place determined. The Arabic word used here is mustaqar, which has two meanings. Either it means for a period determined, or it means to a place determined. And today science says that the sun is moving to a particular spot, known as solar apex, and it will exist for a particular time period. So both the meanings of mustaqar, to a place determined, and for a period determined, according to science, is perfect. Imagine, Quran mentions this 1400 years ago. When I was in school, I had learned that there are three types of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And previously, the scientists believed that the space outside the astronomical systems in the galaxy, it was vacuum. Lately, the scientists have discovered that there are bridges of matter in the interstellar space. It's not vacuum. And it is called as plasma. And they say this matter is in a form of gaseous matter, which has equal number of positive ions as well as electrons. And the Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 59. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the heaven and the earth as well as things in between it. So Quran says, there is matter in between the heavens and the earth. Which today science 
they say that this plasma can be considered as the fourth type of matter. Today, science also tells us that the atmosphere of the Earth, it acts like a filter and prevents the harmful radiations from outer space to come onto the surface of the Earth. It prevents the X-rays and the ultraviolet rays to reach the surface of the Earth, which is very important for the sustenance of life. If this filter of the Earth's atmosphere wasn't there, then life would not exist on the face of the Earth. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 32, that we have made the sky as a protected ceiling. We have made the heavens, the Arabic word is Samawat, we have made the heavens, that is the sky, as a canopy well guarded. Today, science has come to know that this protected ceiling, without this, life would have ceased to exist on the face of the earth. It was in 1925, a very famous scientist by the name of Edwin Hubble and a famous astronomer, he said that the galaxies are receding. That means the universe is expanding. The Quran mentioned 14 years ago in Surah Dharyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space. The Arabic word Musyun means vastness or the expanding universe. The Quran mentions 14 years ago that the universe is expanding, which we have come to know recently, eight years back, 90 years back. And according to Stephen Hawkins, who's a very famous scientist, he writes in his book, The Brief History of Time, he says that the discovery of the expanding universe is the greatest discovery of the century, which is mentioned in the Quran 14 centuries before. There may be skeptics or some non-Muslims who will say, it is nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy since the Arabs were very well advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree with them that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. But I'd like to remind them, it was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. And there were many things about astronomy mentioned in the Quran which the Arabs didn't speak about and which we have come to recently. In the field of physics, several centuries ago, there was a theory which was called as atomism. This was advanced by the Greeks, especially the Democrats, who lived 2,300 years before. And according to this theory of atomism, atom is the smallest part of matter. And this was also known to the Arabs. And the Arabic word for atom, in Arabic, it's called a zarra. And the Arabs also agreed the smallest part of matter, nothing can be smaller than that. And if you read the Quran, the Quran too speaks about the atom. Now, after science has advanced in the field of physics, we agree that atom is the smallest particle of matter having the characteristics of the element, but an atom too can be divided. So does it mean that the Quran is outdated? Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 3, as well as in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 61, that when they say, that is unbelievers, that the final hour will never come, tell them it will surely come by the Lord, in whose knowledge is the unseen, and in whose record is the smallest detail of an atom, and there is nothing smaller or greater than an atom which is not there without being mentioned in his record. Clearly, that's propitious. So the Quran says that Allah has the knowledge of the unseen, the minutest detail of the atom is mentioned, and even things greater and smaller than the atom 
is very clearly mentioned in his record. So the Quran mentions 1400 years ago that there are things smaller than the atom, which science has discovered recently. In the field of hydrology, we learn about the water cycle in the school. The water cycle of what we learn in the school was first described in 1580 by Sir Bernard Palissy. And we learned in school that the water evaporates from the ocean. It forms into clouds. The clouds move. They rise. They condense. And the water falls and flows back into the ocean. And the water cycle is completed. Previously, in 7th century BC, Thales of Miletus, he said, it was the spray of the ocean which was picked up by the winds which fell into the interior as rain. People did not know how did the rain fall. So in the seventh century, Thales of Belitis, he said, it was the spray of the ocean which was picked up by the winds and fell into the interior as rain. People did not know from where did the underground water come. And people believe, even in the time of Plato, that when the water fell, this water flowed by a secret passage into the ocean called Astartarus. People did not know from where did the underground water come. So they thought it was the pressure of the winds on the water which forced the water into the interior. And even till as late as 17th century, people and great thinkers like Descartes believed in this theory. Even in 19th century, people believed in the Aristotle's theory that the water evaporated from the earth and cooled in mountain caverns which fed the springs. Today we know that the underground water is due to the seepage of the rainwater. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21, seest not thou that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sends on water from the sky and causes it to soak in the grounds causes springs in the ground and then causes sown field of various colors to grow. Quran mentions in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 24. It is Allah who sends down water from the sky and then gives life to the earth after it is dead. The Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. It is we who send down water from the sky and we can store it, and we can even drain it easily. The Quran says in Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22, that we cause fecundating winds. The Arabic word used is lawaki, which is the plural of lakaha coming from lakhi, which means to fecundate, which means to impregnate. We cause fecundating winds. We cause winds to impregnate, and then the water falls from the sky. And today we know that science tells us that the pollen is picked up by the winds and it impregnates the clouds. And the second type is the clouds, they join together. Then there's lightning and water falls from the sky. A similar message of hydrology and water cycle is mentioned in Surah Noor, chapter number 24, verse number 43. It is Allah who makes the clouds to move gently and then causes them to join, then makes them into a heap, and then water emerges from the sky. Quran says in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 48, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who makes the clouds to rise, then makes it into fragments, and then water falls from the sky. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. The Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11, was sama izatil raji, which means by the capacity of the heavens to return. Besides the sky or the heavens acting like a protected ceiling, besides reflecting all the unwanted dangerous rays back into the space, it also returns back the water evaporation. What the water evaporates from the ocean, the sky, it sends it back onto the earth. And the Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43, that we cause water to fall from the sky, from mountains of clouds. And when we're traveling in an aeroplane, aeroplane wasn't there 14 years back, and when we look at the clouds below, we see 
it is like mountain of wolves. The clouds, they appear as mountains. Imagine, Quran mentioned that 14 years ago. Quran describes the water cycle in great detail in several verses. Besides the several verses I quoted, there are many other umpteen number of verses which speak about the water cycle. It's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. It's mentioned in Surah Jashia, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. It's mentioned in Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 67 to 70. It's mentioned in Surah Mulk, chapter number 16, verse number 30. You can go on only quoting the several verses of the Quran which speak about the water cycle. You can only give a talk on hydrology and water cycle in the Quran. In the field of geology, and the geologists today, they tell us that the radius of the earth on which we live is approximately 3,750 miles. And the deeper layers, they are hot and fluid. It cannot sustain life. And as you keep on going superficially, it keeps on getting cooler. And the superficial crust on which we live, it is hardly less than 30 miles in thickness. And the geologists, they tell us, there are high possibilities that this superficial crust on which we live, it can shake. And today the geologists tell us, they talk about the folding phenomena, which gives rise to mountain ranges. And because of this folding phenomena, and because of this mountain, there is stability on the earth. The Quran says, in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, we have made the earth as an expanse. Well, Jabala Autada and the mountains as stakes. The Arabic word Autad means stakes or tent pegs. Like how we put a tent peg into the ground, we see only a small portion on the top. The major portion goes deep into the ground. So the Quran says the mountains are like tent pegs. And today science tells us that the mountain has got deep roots. And the portion we see on the top is only a small portion, like the tip of an iceberg. The major portion of the iceberg is in the water, and only a small portion is on the top. And science tells us that the mountains are put firmly on the earth. And Quran gives this message 14 years ago in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 32, as well as Surah Kashya, chapter number 88, verse number 19, that we have placed on the earth mountains standing firm. As far as the subject of geology is concerned, a book by the name The Earth, which is known as one of the best textbooks in the field of geology and is referred in most of the universities in the subject. And one of its authors, his name is Frank Press, who was the president of the Academy of Sciences of USA earlier, and was also the advisor to the ex-president of USA, Jimmy Carter. And he writes in this book, and he draws the mountain, and shows that the mountain has got deep roots in the shape of wedge, wedge shape. And he shows that the mountain that is seen above the surface of the earth is only a small portion. The major portion has got deep roots. And he writes in this book that it is due to the mountain which prevents the earth from shaking. And this is exactly what is mentioned in the Quran 14 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, as well as Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 10, that we have placed on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. The Quran specifically mentions that the function of the mountain is to prevent the earth from shaking, which we have come to know recently. In the subject of oceanology, there's a verse in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, and the other salty and bitter. 
Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. The same message is repeated in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19. Marajal Bahrain al Taqyan. That we have let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier, there is a barzakh which is forbidden to be trespassed. When the commentators of the Quran, when they try to understand this verse, all of us know very well, and we knew it earlier also, that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. But they could not understand the verse of the Quran, which says that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be test passed. There is a barzakh. The Mufassirins, the commentator could not understand what did it mean. Today, after science have advanced, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, sweet water flows into the salty water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This transitional homogenizing area, according to the Quran, is called as the barzakh. It is an unseen barrier. And this has been testified and verified when this verse of the Quran was shown to Prophet Zahay, who is a very famous marine scientist and a professor in oceanology in the University of Colorado in USA. And he said that what the Quran mentions 1400 years ago has been testified by science recently. And this phenomena can be seen even with the naked eye at the Cape Point, the southernmost tip of Cape Town in South Africa, where one type of water flowed into the other type. We even see that the colors of both these waters differ. Another good example is in Egypt, when the river Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea. And the best example is the Gulf Stream. It flows for thousands of miles. It starts from the Gulf of Mexico and goes to the east side of North America, travels upwards, then goes eastwards and travels to the west coast of Europe. It flows for thousands of miles, but yet the two waters are distinct. And if you're traveling in a ship towards the extreme of the Gulf Stream, and pick up, take a bucket of water from the left side and a bucket of water from the right side, you will find that one is sweet and the other is salty. Even the temperature between the two, they differ. Imagine, Quran speaks about this phenomena 1400 years ago. In the subject of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّا شَيْنْ هَيْ أَفْلَا يُمِنُونَ We have made from water, every living thing. Will you not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, the Quran says, we have made from water every living thing. Who could have believed in it? Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that every living creature has got cells, and the basic substance of cell is cytoplasm, which contains about 80% water. And today, science tells us that every living creature contains about 50 to 90% water. Quran mentioned in Surah Noor, chapter number 24, verse number 45. We have created every living animal from water. The Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, we have created every human being from water. In the field of botany, previously we did not know that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. We have come to know about this recently. Recently, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back. The Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sends on water from the sky. And with it brings various pairs of plants, each separate from the other. The Arabic word used, each separate from the other, meaning male and female. The Arabic word used in the verse of the Quran is azwaj, meaning spouses. Sexes, male or female. So Quran says that every kind of plant has been made into sexes, male and female. And today science tells us that all the plants, they have got male and female sexes. 
even the unisexual plant, they have distinct characteristic of male and female. The Quran says in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 3, we have created every kind of fruit in pairs, two and two. Even the fruits are created in male and female. And today we know that the superior plants, the end stage is the fruit. Before that stage is the flower, which has got stamens and ovules, male and female. And pollen comes and fertilizes, and then we have the fruit, having distinct characteristic of male and female. Even the parthenocarpic fruits, even they like banana, figs, certain types of pineapple, oranges, they have distinct characteristic. These are unfertilized fruits, flowers from unfertilized, the fruits obtained. Even they have distinct characteristics of male and female. The Quran says further in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 36. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created every animal in pairs and human being in pairs and even things which you know and don't know. Allah says he has created everything in pairs. So besides human beings, animals, plants, even things which we don't know. Today we know that things like electricity also have got positive and negative, the electrons and protons. And many things which we don't know. So Allah says, He has created everything in pairs. Things we know as well as things we don't know. In the field of zoology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38. We have made every animal that lives on this earth and every creature which has wings and flies in the air to live in community like the human beings. Today we have come to know that the animals and birds, like the human beings, they too live in communities. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has taught the bee to build its cells in hills, on trees, and human habitations, and to eat of what the earth produces, and to find the spacious path of thy Lord with great skill. So what we have come to know recently, Quran says, it has taught the bee to find the spacious path of thy Lord with great skill. Today, in science, we call it the bee dance. And previously we thought, it was the male bee which was the worker bee. Today we have come to know that it is not the male bee, it is the female bee which is the worker bee. And the gender used in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 16 and 69, is fasluki and kuli, meaning a female bee. No wonder Shakespeare in his play, Henry IV, he mentions about people talking among themselves, about the bee, that the soldier bee, the male soldier bee, they go and report to the king. Today we have come to know it is not the male bee which is the soldier bee. They are the female bees which are the worker bees and soldier bees. And they don't report to the king, but they report to the queen. Imagine, even the gender of the worker bee, the soldier bee is mentioned in the Quran as the female gender which we have come to know recently. The Quran says in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, before Solomon marched his host of men, jinns, and birds, and when they approached a lowly valley of ants, one of the ants said, O ye ants, get into the habitations, lest Solomon and his host will trample you beneath the feet. People would think, what kind of a fairy tale book is the Quran? The ants speaking among themselves? You know, we have fairy tale books. So what type of a fairy tale book is the Quran? The ants talking and speaking among themselves. After science advanced, we have come to know the animal or insect which has the closest resemblance to the human being is the ant. The ants bury the dead the same way as human beings do. They have a sophisticated method of labor. 
in which they have supervisors, managers, foremen, workers, etc. They have a sophisticated method of communication. They very often even meet to chat. They have marketplaces where they exchange goods. You know, souks, we have marketplaces. Even ants have got marketplaces where they exchange goods. And if in monsoon, during rainy season, if while storing the grain, if the grain gets wet, the ants get the grain in the sunlight to dry, as though they knew that humidity will cause the rotting of the grain. And if the grain begins to bud, they chop off the bud as though they knew that budding will cause the rotting of the grain. Imagine, Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the ants 1400 years ago, which we have come to know recently. The Quran says in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41, As to those who take for protectors, anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they build for themselves houses like that of a spider. For verily, the house of a spider is flimsy. Besides the Quran saying that any human being who takes for protectors, anyone besides Almighty God, Allah, they're building for themselves houses like that of a spider. Talking about the web. And the house of the spider is flimsy. We know that the web is a very flimsy house. But besides this, today we have come to know that many a time the male spider is killed by the female spider. The relationship of the husband and wife is not good in the spiders. So besides the Quran talking about the flimsy physical nature of the house of a person, who takes the protector besides Almighty God, is also talking about the relationships in the house. In the field of physiology, it was 600 years after the Quran was revealed that Ibn Nafis, he described the blood circulation. And 1,000 years after the Quran was revealed, 400 years after Ibn Nafis, William Harvey made it famous to the world. So in our textbook, we know the blood circulation was first described by William Harvey. Actually, it was Ibn Nafis 400 years ago. This is all media. And today we know that the food we eat, it goes into the stomach, then goes into the intestine. Just in a nutshell, as far as physiology is concerned, about the blood circulation and the production of milk, the food which enters the intestine, the substance of the food, it enters into the bloodstream through the vessels of the intestine and via the complex media, very often through the liver, via the bloodstream, it reaches almost all the organs of the body, including the mammary glands, which is responsible for the production of milk. So what we have come to know today about the blood circulation and the production of milk is mentioned in a nutshell in the Quran 1400 years ago, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, we say that verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink from what is within the body, coming from a conjunction between the constituents of the intestine and blood, milk, which is pure for you to have. And the same message is repeated in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, that verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink milk, which is pure, that comes from the within the bodies of the cattle, and in it are various benefits and of the meat you can eat. So Quran speaks about the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell 1400 years ago. In the field of medicine, previously we did not know that the honey was obtained from the belly of the bee. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 69, from the belly of the bees, we give you a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for humankind. It was only 300 years before, approximately, we came to know that the honey was obtained from the belly of the bee. And now we have come to know that honey is rich in vitamin K as well as fructose. Recently, we have come to know that even the honey has got mild antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russian soldiers in World War II, they used the honey to cover up the wounds, which 
prevented the evaporation of moisture, and the healing in the wound was done with leaving of very little scar tissue. And due to the density of honey, germs and bacteria were prevented to grow in the wound. And if a patient is suffering from the allergy of a particular plant, if honey is obtained from that plant and given to that patient, that patient starts developing resistance to it. Imagine what science has come to know today recently. Quran mentions that in the honey, there is healing for humankind. In the field of embryology, there were a group of students who collected all the data that they could find in the Quran, as well as the Hadith, dealing with embryology. And they followed the verse of the Quran, Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, which says, First, Alu Ahali Zikri in Kuntum La Talamu. If you don't know, if you are in doubt, ask the person who's knowledgeable. So these Arab students, they collected the verses of the Quran and the Hadith dealing with embryology and translated it into English and presented it to Prophet Keith Moore, that was about 30 years back, in the late 70s. And Prophet Keith Moore at that time was one of the highest authorities in the field of embryology. And he was the head of the Department of Anatomy in the University of Toronto in Canada. When he went through all the translation verses of the Quran and the Hadith, he said that most of the verses of the Quran, which speak about embryology, are in perfect conformity with latest advances of embryology. But there are a couple of verses which I cannot say that they are right. Neither can I say they are wrong because I myself don't know about it. And two such verses were the first two verses of the Quran to be revealed of Surah Ikra or Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse number one and two, which says, Ikra bismi rabbika lazi khalaq. Khalaq al insana min alaq. Read, recite, proclaim in the name of thy Lord who has created. Who has created the human beings from something which clings a leech like substance. So Prophet Keith Moore said, I don't know whether the human beings, the embryo, embryology means it's the study of the development of the human being, the early stages of human being in the womb of the mother, for those who don't know. He said that I do not know whether the initial stages of the embryo, that's the initial stages of human being, it looks like a leech or not. So he went in his laboratory and under a very powerful microscope observed the early stages of the embryo and compared it with the photograph of a leech. And he was astonished at the striking resemblance. And later, when 80 questions were asked to him regarding embryology in the Quran and the Hadith, he said that if you had asked me these questions 30 years ago, that means from today more than 60 years back, I would not be able to answer more than 50% because embryology is a new branch of medicine which has developed recently. And whatever additional information he got, he included in the new edition of his book, The Developing Human. The Developing Human is one of the books referred by most of the students throughout the world in the first year of MBBA, first year of medical college. And even I, when I was in the first year of the medical college in Bombay, if we had to get just pass marks, we used to refer to the book written by Inder Bir Singh. If you wanted to score in embryology, we had to refer to the developing human by Professor Keith Moore. So Professor Keith Moore, he incorporated this new information he got from the Quran and the Hadith into the third edition of his book, The Developing Human, which got the award for the best medical book written by a single author. And later on, this book was translated into several languages of the world. And Professor Keith Moore said that this information in the Quran cannot come from human source. The author of this Quran has to be Almighty God. And he said that he has no objection in agreeing that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the messenger of this God. Imagine Prophet Keith Moore being a Christian said that. Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5 to 7, that does not man know from what is created. He is created from a drop coming forth from a space between the backbone and the ribs. 
What does the Quran mean by saying the human beings have been created from a drop coming from a space between the backbone and the ribs? Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that the genital organs in the human beings in the embryonic age, when the child is in the womb of the mother, it developed from a space close to the kidney. That is a space between the spinal column and the 11th and 12th rib. In the male, the genital organ, the male gonads are the testes. In the females, the female gonads, they are the ovaries. And later on, in the embryonic age, these genital organs, the gonads, they descend. In the female, the ovary descends till the true pelvis. And in the male, via the inguinal canal, it descends to the scrotum. But even after descending in the adult life, yet these genital organs, they receive the nerve supply from the same space between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. And the blood supply from the aorta, which is present in the same space between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. And the venous return and the lymphatic drainage goes to the same space, the space between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. The Quran mentions in no less than 11 different places that the human beings have been created from a nutfa. It's also mentioned in Surah Hajj, chapter 22, verse number 5, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 13, that the human beings have been created from nutfa, which means a minute quantity of liquid. What does the Quran mean that we have created the human beings from a minute quantity of liquid? The Quran also says in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 8, that we have created the human being from a quintessence. And we have created the human beings from solala. The Arabic word solala, besides meaning quintessence, it also means the best part of the whole. So besides the Quran saying we have created the human beings from minute quantity of liquid, it also says we have created the human beings from the best part of the whole. And today science tells us that only one spermatozoa out of the millions of sperms that are emitted is sufficient to fertilize the ovum. Only one out of several millions. So this one out of several millions the Quran refers as nutfa minute quantity and solala, the best part of the whole. One out of several millions. The Quran further says in Surah Insan, chapter 76, verse number 2, we have created the human being from nutfat and amshaj, from a minute quantity of mingled fluids. Today, science says that both the male fluid and the female fluid, both are responsible for the birth of the baby. So minute quantity of mingled fluids. And besides the male and the female fluids, even the surrounding fluids take part, prostatic fluid, etc. In the field of genetics, today we have come to know that it is the sperm which is responsible for determining the sex of the child. And today science tells us that the 23rd pair of chromosomes in the human being, it determines the sex of the child. If it's XX, it's a female. If it's XY, then it's a male. So it is the sperm which is responsible for determining the sex. If the X of the sperm takes part in the fertilization, then a female is born. If the Y takes part, then a male is born. And this is exactly what the Quran says in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 45 and 46, that we have created the human being from a minute quantity of liquid which is ejaculated. Minute quantity of liquid, ejaculated means it has to be a male fluid. The similar message is repeated in Surah Qiyama, chapter number 75, verse number 37 to 39, that we have created the human being from a minute quantity of sperm. min man yumna. We have created the human being from minute quantity of sperm, then made it into an alaka, then made the alaka into mudga, then gave it sex, male and female. So the Quran says that the sperm is responsible for the sex of the child, whether it's male or female. In this country of us, this great country, India, for reasons known best to the Indians, in India mainly, most of the people, they prefer having sons rather than daughters. 
And if a lady gives birth to a daughter, very often the mother-in-law, she will blame the daughter-in-law. That why did you give birth to a daughter? According to the science and the Quran, if the mother-in-law has to blame anyone, she should not blame the daughter-in-law, she should blame the son. Because it is the male fluid which is responsible for discipline the sex of the child, male or female. Actually, it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who makes it male or female. But if the mother-in-law has to blame anyone, she should blame the son. Because he is responsible for the sex of the child, male or female. The Quran says in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 6, that we have made the human beings in stages, one after the other, in three waves of darkness. According to Prophet Keith Moore, he said that this verse of the Quran, when it mentions the three waves of darkness, it refers to the anterior abdominal wall, the uterine wall, and the amniochorionic membrane. That the human being is made into stages in three waves of darkness. The Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail. The Quran mentions in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14, that we have created the human being from a quintessence of clay, then made it into a nutfah, a minute quantity of liquid, then made the nutfah into alaka, a leech-like substance, then made the alaka into mudga, that's a chewed-like lump, then made the mudga into izama, bones, then clothed the bones with lahem, that is flesh, and then we made a different creature. Glory be to Allah, who's the best to create. These three verses of the Quran describe the various embryological stages, the initial stages of development of a human being in the mother's womb in great detail. First it says that we made it from a nutfah which we discussed, a minute quantity of liquid. Then made the nutfah into alaka. That means a leech-like substance, which we discussed earlier. The meaning of the Arabic word alaka, it has got three meanings. One is a leech-like substance. It also means something which clings. And the third meaning of alaka is congealed clot of blood. Besides it looking like a leech, the embryo in the initial stages, it also behaves like a leech. It behaves like a blood sucker. It derives its nutrition from the mother through the placenta it behaves like a blood sucker. So besides looking like a leech, it also behaves like a leech. The second meaning, something which clings, we know that the embryo clings to the uterine wall. Throughout the nine months that the fetus is in the womb of the mother, it clings to the uterine wall. The third meaning of alaka is congealed clot of blood. And today's science tells us that in the initial stages, the blood does not circulate. And the blood clots in the vessels and it appears like a congealed clot of blood. So all three meanings of Allah, alhamdulillah, today's science says, is in perfect conformity to latest advances made in embryology. It further says, we placed it in a kararim makin, a place of security. And we know today that the fetus is protected posteriorly by the spinal column, that the backbone, as well as the posterior muscles. And anteriorly, it is protected by the anterior abdominal wall, by the amniocorionic membrane, as well as the amniotic fluid, which protects the child. So the science today testifies that the child is well protected in the womb of the mother. It further says, we made the alaka into a mudga. A mudga means a chewed-like lump. So Professor Keith Moore took a plaster seal and made it look into a leech-like substance, initial stage of embryo, and then placed it between his teeth. He bit it to make it appear like a mutga, a chewed-like lump. And when he saw it, the teeth marks, it resembled the somites from where the nerves develop. And the Quran continues, we made the mutga into izama bones, then clothed the bones with lahem, that is flesh. Then we made it altogether a different creature. So what does the Quran mean that we made it into altogether a different creature? Till this stage of mutga, izama, lahem, chewed-like lump, bones, flesh. Till this stage, today science tells us, the initial stages of development 
of a human being is similar to the development of a fish, rabbit, and many other animals. Only after this stage does the human development differ in looks, where we have a head, then we have limbs, then the Quran says, we made it into a different creature. Glory be to Allah, who is the best to create. Imagine, the Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail. And Prophet Keith Moore, he said that this description given in the Quran, based on shapes, alaka, leech-like substance, mudga, chewed like lump, izama, bones, laham, flesh, is far superior to the divisions made in modern embryology, where we say stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, it's difficult to identify. The description given in the Quran is far more superior and much more easy. And previously the scientists, they thought, it was in the 16th and 17th century, when scientists like Swamadam, they thought that the sperm contained the miniature human being. The head of the sperm contained the miniature human being and then it grew in the womb of the mother. Later on, when they came to know that the size of the ovum is bigger than the sperm, D. Graffe, he said that the human being is present in the ovum and not the sperm. Later on in 18th century, Mao Paratis, he propounded the biparental theory that both the ovum and the sperm is responsible for the creation of the human being. They fertilize, they form the zygote, which the Quran has described in great detail. Furthermore, the Quran says in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 5, that we have created the human beings from a minute quantity of clay, made into alaka, made the alaka into mudga, partly formed and partly unformed. This verse of the Quran was taken to Dr. Marshall Johnson, who is the head of the Department of Anatomy in Daniel Institute in Sir Thomas Jefferson University in USA, in Philadelphia. Now we have come to know in science that if at this stage we cut the embryo and we analyze the organs, we find some of the organs are formed, some are not formed. So Professor Marshall Johnson said, if we describe this stage of the embryo as a complete creation, it will be wrong because some organs are not formed. If we label it as an incomplete creation, that's also wrong because some of the organs are formed. So there's no better description than the description mentioned in the Quran, partly formed and partly unformed. In Arabic, it can also be treated as differentiated and undifferentiated. And Prof. Marshall Johnson said that at this stage, some cells are differentiated, some are undifferentiated. Further is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 9, that we have given the human beings the faculty of hearing and sight. It's mentioned in Surah Insan, chapter number 76, verse number 2. We have given to the human being the gift of hearing, sight, and feeling. So the Quran first speaks about hearing, then it speaks about sight. And today science tells us the first sense to develop in a human being is the sense of hearing. By the 22nd day, the year starts to formulate, and by the fifth month of pregnancy, it is completed. And later on, the eye splits open, that's in the seventh month of pregnancy. So the Quran is perfect in conformity with science. First come the sense of hearing, then come the sense of sight. There was an experiment done where a baby whose mother was a typist, a newborn baby was taken, and the mother of that baby was a typist, and that baby born to a typist was placed along with other nine babies who were born to normal mothers who were not typists. And the typewriter was sounded. All the babies were scared except the baby of the typist. Because the baby of the typist was used to hearing the typewriter in the womb of the mother. So the baby was used to it, so he wasn't scared. You know, there are many hadiths which say that the pregnant woman should read the Quran. Today, science has confirmed that when the mother is pregnant, when the lady is pregnant, what she sees, what she hears, what she listens, has an impact on the child. I would just like to mention two more things before in my talk. The Quran mentioned in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, 
where the unbelievers say that after we have died, after human beings have died and have been buried and their bones have got disintegrated, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, be able to reassemble our bones on the day of judgment? So Allah gives a reply that tell them, Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your fingers. What does the Quran mean by saying, Almighty God on the day of resurrection? He can not only reconstruct your bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your fingers. It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold, he discovered the fingerprinting method. And he said that no two fingerprints, even in a million human beings, can be identical. And today, people use the fingerprinting method, especially the police, the FBI, the CIA, the CID, to identify the criminal, the robber. And this fingerprinting method, which we came to know in 1880, Almighty God describes in the Quran 1400 years ago. He can not only reconstruct your bones, he can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your fingers. I would like to end my talk by giving the last example of Prophet Takarada Gashon. Prophet Takarada Gashon is head of the Department of Anatomy in the University of Shanghai in Thailand. And he spent a great deal of time in doing research of pain receptors. We doctors, previously we thought that only the brain was responsible for the feeling of pain. Recently, we have come to know that besides the brain, there are certain receptors in the skin which are called as pain receptors, which are responsible for the feeling of pain. Without the pain receptors, the human being cannot feel pain. That's the reason whenever a patient of burn injury comes to a doctor, he takes a pin and pricks it in the area of burn. If the patient feels pain, the doctor is happy. It's a superficial burn. The pain receptors, they're intact. If the patient does not feel pain, then the doctor is sad. The pain receptors have been destroyed. It's a deep burn. The Quran mentions in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 56, As to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them into the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skins so that they shall feel the pain. What does the Quran mean by saying that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them into the hellfire. And as often as their skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. Indicating that there is something in the skin which is responsible for the feeling of the pain. And today, the scientists and medical doctors have discovered that there are pain receptors in the skin which are responsible for the feeling of pain. When this translation of the verse was given to Prophet Taqarat Rashan, he said, it is impossible. How could a book written 1400 years ago mention about pain receptors? He could not believe in it. Later on, after verifying the translation and speaking with other scientists, he was so impressed with the Quran that in the eighth medical conference held in Riyadh, in the conference itself he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon me, the Messenger of Allah. Wa akhru dawana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir Naik. Before I begin the question and answers, a little about myself. In 1996, I accepted Islam at the University of California, Berkeley. And the lecture which facilitated my acceptance of Islam was a fraction of this lecture. Had I heard this, I probably would have been overblown. And uh, mashallah, you, some people are just given that gift. And uh, you have been given that gift. I shouldn't praise people in their presence, but... Now, back to the question and answers. In order to make this run as smoothly and quickly as possible, I would ask everyone in attendance tonight to please keep your questions strictly to the topic, to ask your question briefly, to be orderly at the mics and queue in a line, and do not bunch. And I would also like to remind everyone here in the audience that we are brothers and sisters in humanity. 
and for those non-Muslims who are with us tonight, you are our brothers and you are our sisters, and we will give you a priority at the mics. So if you have a question, we ask that the volunteers facilitate those people in getting to the microphones, and they have the priority. Brothers and sisters, if you came with a non-Muslim guest and they are slightly shy, please do motivate them to ask their question because we have people who can give the best answers, inshallah. And uh, for those Muslims here, you have many opportunities, so please do let the non-Muslims ask their questions. Uh, we have three microphones, one in the rear for the brothers, in the front for the brothers, and one in the sister section here. So if you have a question, try to make your way to these one, two, three microphones. Written questions will receive second priority. Those questions at the microphone will be answered first. I know that we have one very patient brother who is a non-Muslim, and he waited this entire talk to ask his question. So at this time, I will go to the front mic in the males section and ask the brother to please state your name, your occupation, and then briefly state your question. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Aditya, and I'm doing my final year engineering in Chennai. Um, though I'm a Hindu, I have been having this uh, question about Islam that I wanted to ask, and no better a person than Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, as you said in your speak many times, the Holy Quran was written 1400 years ago and is considered the most worthy and the latest revelation given by Allah. So I have two questions to you. Allah, who knows all, why didn't he give his best of revelation the first time itself to the first of messengers? And why did God take so many times to give his best of knowledge? And my second question, which is related to this is, even before the Holy Quran was written, that is 1400 years ago, human beings had lived in the earth for thousands of years. So why did Allah, the most merciful, didn't give them that best knowledge which he has given us for the last 1400 years? Thank you. The brother asked a very good question, very relevant question. Two questions, both the questions overlapping the answers. He said that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give this last and final revelation 1400 years ago? Why not in day one when you meet me over there? And second part, which is a part of the same question, that what about the people who lived before 14 years ago? They were deprived of the Quran. So if Allah is most merciful, most gracious, most beneficent, so isn't it that the people earlier before 14 years were deprived? Very good question. To reply to your question, my son, he tells me that, Abba, father, you want me to become a doctor? Why do you want me nursery, first standard, second standard, then school, then college. Why don't you put me into medical college directly? If I want my son to become a medical doctor, I don't have to put him into the medical college directly. I have to first make the grounds very clear. First he goes into the pre-primary school, then goes into the school, first standard onwards on passes school, then goes to the higher school, then college, and when he's fit, then he enters the medical college. Similarly, Almighty God, who has knowledge of the unseen, has knowledge of everything, he even has knowledge of the human beings. So, it is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Allah says, ajlin kitab, that we have sent a revelation in every age, in every period. By name, four are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. But there were several revelations sent. The first revelation, Almighty God, knew that the human beings had to develop. If he would have revealed the Quran at the first time, at the time of Adam, peace be upon him, he knew the human beings won't be able to grasp it. That is the reason in the revelation that came before the Quran, that is the Injil. Today we have the Bible, though we don't consider the Bible to be the Injil, but some parts of the Bible may be the word of God. It's mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of John. Chapter number 16, verse number 20 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall show you the way to come. He shall glorify me. So here, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, 
He knew, but yet he said that you will not be able to grasp it. Therefore, when the last and final messenger will come, he will show you things to come. So similarly, Almighty God, he knew very well that when is the right time for the human beings to receive the last and final revelation of the Quran, and that was about 1400 years ago. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, what about the people that came before the Quran was revealed? I will tell them that if my son goes to standard one, he will not be given the medical question paper. He'll be given the question paper of standard one. If he goes to higher school, he'll be given the question of higher school, then junior college, fine? So similarly, the basic message of Almighty God in all the scriptures, in all the revelations, from the first revelation till the last revelation, Quran was the same, that you have to believe in one God, that you have to worship him and no one else. So all the messengers, right from the first messenger, Adam, peace be upon him, right down to Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, all of them taught the basic message of oneness of God and about Tawheed. And about this message, of oneness of God and Tawheed, inshallah, I'll be discussing in detail on the last day of this conference, on the last Sunday, that the 20th of January, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you for the question. Do we have another question from a guest here, non-Muslim? Okay, we'll go to the gentleman section, rear microphone. Gentlemen, could you please state your name and your occupation, please? Good evening, everyone. My name is Sanjeev. Um, I'm working here in Land Marvel Company as an admin executive. Uh, I got a few questions, but I'll ask only two questions uh, regarding this uh, Islam. First question is, uh, uh, do Islam believe in rebirth? Uh, and second question is, in Islam, it's not allowed to commit suicide. But many people that in Pakistan, in Arabic countries, they are uh, blowing themselves up and they are killing many people. So who, they, who are the people they are motivating them? Whether they are fall, really following the Islam or who is motivating them? That is my question, sir. The brother has two questions. The first question, does Islam believe in rebirth? And the second question, that is suicide prohibited in Islam? How come people in Pakistan, other part of the world, they are blowing up themselves and killing themselves? The two questions. As far as the first question is concerned, that does Islam believe in rebirth? If you ask only in rebirth, yes, Islam believes in rebirth. What we believe? That a human being has come to this world once, the Quran says, that we give you life and come on this earth. Then we cause you to die, and then we resurrect you again in the next life. This is exactly what is mentioned in the Vedas. If you read Rig Ved, book number 10, it speaks about punar janam. Punar means next, janam means life. So the Ved speaks about punar janam, about the next life. But unfortunately, most of the Hindus, they misunderstand the meaning of punar janam. Punar means next, janam means life. We believe in the next life. You say punar janam, you say rebirth, we have no problem. But most of the Hindus, they believe in a philosophy known as samsara. It's a Sanskrit word, samsara, which means birth, death, birth, death. A cycle of reincarnation, a cycle of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. This cycle of birth, death, birth, death, or samsara, or reincarnation, is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. What they quote is a verse of Bhagavad Gita, Chapter number two, verse number 22, which says that like a human being takes off the old clothes and puts on new clothes, same way the soul throws away the old body and puts on the new body. As far as this is concerned, I've got no objection with the Bhagavad Gita. It's further mentioned even in the Upanishads that like a caterpillar walks up a grass of blade, it jumps on to the new grass, I've got no problem. Now, as far as the scriptures are concerned, if you take the literal meaning of the Ved, which does not speak about the cycle of birth, death, birth, death, but only speaks about punar janam, next life, Islam speaks the same. But most of the scholars of Hinduism, they could not understand that how can a human being be 
born with some congenital defect. How can he be born as a handicap? Some are born healthy, some are born handicapped, some are born in rich family, some are born in poor family. So they thought this was injustice. So how could God be unjust? Therefore, they propounded the theory of samsara, which is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. The Vedas are considered as the highest Hindu scriptures. In the Hindu scriptures, we have the Smriti and you have the Shruti. Smriti means scripture written by the human beings. And Shruti are the Vedas and Upanishads considered to be the word of God. Now, because they could not justify why some people are born in rich family, some in poor family, some are born healthy, some with congenital defect. They propounded this theory of samsara. As far as Islam is concerned, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allazi khalakal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life you're leading is a test for the hereafter. And we believe that every child is born sinless, is born masoom irrespective whether he's born handicapped or healthy, whether rich family, poor family, all these things are a test for the human beings. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, and Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, he says that surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of life, and loss of what you have earned. It's mentioned in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, that your children and your wives are a test for you. Now here we realize that the Quran says your children are a test for you. Now if a child, suppose, is born handicapped, it's a test for the parents. The parents may be very good, they may be pious, maybe Allah wants to test them more. After giving them a child which is handicapped, yet do they have faith in Allah or not? It's a test. So whenever any calamity befalls any human being, it's either a punishment or a test. Whenever any good thing happens in your life, it's either a reward or it's a test. That does not mean if something bad happens, it has to be a punishment. It can be a punishment, it can be a test. If something good happens in your life, it can be a reward or it can be a test. So here, Almighty God is testing the parents that do they have faith in Almighty God? So if a handicapped child is born, the parent may be an average Muslim, and if he says, oh, why? My child only has to be born handicapped. Why my child has to be born with a congenital heart disease? Allah is testing them. The people who are good Muslims, they'll say, Allah has destined, no problem yet. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more difficult the test, more higher is the reward. To pass a simple graduation of BA is easy. But to pass MBBS is difficult. The moment you pass MBBS in front of any, you get doctor, DR full stop. Higher status. Examination is difficult, the honor is more. So Almighty God tests different people different way. The child that is born, what the Hindus said, the Hindu scholars, in his previous janam, in his previous birth, he did a sin, therefore he was born handicapped. They didn't have any other justification. If you do good deeds, then you are born healthy. So what the Hindu scholars, they propounded, that every living creature, it keeps on changing. According to them, the universal brotherhood in Hinduism is all living creatures are your brothers. So sometimes you are born as an animal, sometimes as a bird, sometimes as a rat, sometimes as a cockroach, sometimes as a human being. And the human being is the highest level. And you're born as a human being seven times. So they came with this philosophy because they could not justify why a child is born rich or poor handicap or healthy. Similarly, for a person who's born poor, it's a test for him. For the rich people, he has to give zakat. Every rich person who has a saving of more than a nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. For the poor person, for him, he gets full marks in zakat. He's poor, so he has to give no zakat, 100 out of 100. But we say, are garib admi, poor man. Poor man. Poor man, he has got 100 out of 100 in zakat. The rich man, if he gives proper zakat, he may get 100 out of 100. He says, okay, fine, I have got so much wealth. This part is exempted from zakat. He may give 50% of zakat. So he'll get negative points. He may not give zakat at all. So imagine, suppose there's a questioner 
There's a question in a question paper which is very easy. Should you be happy or sad? So when a person is born poor, actually in zakat, he gets 100 out of 100. Therefore, beloved prophet said, it's easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. But we say, a adhi, a poor man. How sad. Not sad. 100 out of 100 in zakat. For the rich man, he has to give charity, he has to give zakat, he has to give donation, he'll be accountable for his wealth. So what in Islam, we are born in this world once, and once is sufficient. Once we die, we are resurrected on the day of judgment. You want to call it rebirth, I've got no problem. You want to call it punarjanam, I've got no problem. We say life after death. But surely, if I agree with you for sake of argument, for sake of argument, what the Hindu scholars propound, that, you know, sometime you're born as animal, sometime bird, sometime human being. I want to ask you the question, brother. In this world, as every year is passing on, is the population of the human beings increasing or decreasing, brother? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Increasing. Very good. Is the sin in the world increasing or decreasing? I can't hear you. Increasing or decreasing? Increasing, sir. Sorry? Okay. Increasing. Increasing. Human beings are increasing, and even sin is increasing. If I agree with the philosophy of Hindu scholars, more the sin increases, the population of human beings should decrease. So therefore, I believe in going to the higher scriptures, Vedas. When I talk, we had given the talk earlier in Chennai, during the first peace conference, that was in 2004, similarities between Islam and Hinduism. And there, I showed and compared that even in Vedic speaks about one God, no idol worship, and everything. So what is common between the scriptures we follow? So this, the cycle of samsara, birth, death, birth, death, is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. It's the philosophy of the Hindu scholars to justify because they could not justify why human beings are born poor or healthy, which I've given you the answer in Islam. As far as the second question is concerned, that is suicide haram in Islam, is it prohibited? If yes, then why do people commit suicide? Is somebody instigating them, suicide bombing? The Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 195, that do not make your own hands the cause of your destruction. So according to the Quran, Committing suicide is haram, it is prohibited. So as far as committing suicide, it is prohibited. As far as killing any other innocent human being, the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves a human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. So killing any innocent human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, it is prohibited in Islam. So if anyone, whether he puts a bomb without killing himself or with killing himself, if he kills an innocent human being, it is prohibited. So as far as killing innocent human being is concerned, it is prohibited. If you use it as a strategy of war, you know, the Japanese used to do the suicide, you know. Initially, where do you get suicide bombing from? According to a professor who wrote a book, Dying to Win in America, he says that the first people who did suicide bombing were the LTT, Tamil Tigers. But yet the blame is put on Muslims, I don't know why. It's the media. Have you ever heard of any Muslim doing suicide bombing, it was first the LTT and then the Americans and maybe some of the Muslims, black sheep may have picked up, but who were the originators? But yet when suicide bombing comes, the terrorists are labeled as Muslims. In Chennai a few years back, I had also given the talk on terrorism and jihad, an Islamic perspective. But well, I've described in detail about this answer of suicide bombing as far as Islamic perspective is concerned, but killing innocent human being and committing suicide is haram. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you for the question. We'll go to the front mic with the males. 
If there are any other non-Muslims at the back mic or the sisters' mics, just have the volunteers raise their hands. Any non-Muslim ladies are most welcome to ask the question. And if there are any non-Muslim in the audience, please feel free to come up on the microphone. It's your opportunity. And as previous times I've come to Chennai, Alhamdulillah, all the questions were asked by non-Muslims. So I hope even now the non-Muslims of Chennai, Masha, the bold enough, you can ask any question, even if it's a criticism. Even if you disagree, whatever I say, no problem. Come up and ask the question. Believe me, I'm young, but I can take it. You can criticize the Quran. You can criticize Islam. You can ask. This is the opportunity. Please come up on the microphone and have the doubt cleared. This is the opportunity. And there you've heard it from the man himself. So your name and occupation, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Ramakrishnan. I'm a software engineer. I have two questions for you. The first is, what does Islam say about donating organs after death? Is it okay or is it prohibited? Second question is, what does Islam say about atheists? That's it. The brother has two questions. I think non-Muslim are one they're asking to, no problem. The first question is, what does Islam say about donating organs? Second question is about atheists. As far as the first question is concerned, what does Islam say about donating organs? There's no direct verse in the Quran or any say hadith which says whether organs can be donated or not. But there are various conferences that have held in Saudi Arabia and Malaysia and various different parts of the world. And the scholars have come to common consensus that if three things are fulfilled, then organs can be donated. Number one, the person who requires an organ but natural, it should be a major benefit to his health. He can receive organ as long as it's a benefit or saves his life. Point number two, the person donating the organ, after he donates his organ, it should not be a major loss to his health. For example, if I donate my heart, I will die. So I can't donate my heart. But the doctors say that out of two kidneys present, a person can even survive with one kidney. So if my mother has a kidney failure, both the kidneys have failed, I can very well donate my one kidney to my mother, even she lives, even I live. But naturally, after a person dies, if he wants to donate any other organ, that is permissible. But if he's alive, he should not donate any part of the body which will cause a major damage to his health or a loss of life. And the third criteria is, it should not be for money. No one should sell organ. If all these three conditions are fulfilled, then organ donation very well can be done. As far as the second question is concerned, what does Islam have to say about atheist? As far as I'm concerned, whenever I meet an atheist, are you an atheist, brother? He said, no. Whenever I meet an atheist, the first thing I do is I congratulate that atheist. People may wonder that why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating an atheist is because most of the human beings, they usually do blind belief. He is a Hindu because father is Hindu. He is a Christian, father is a Christian. Many Muslims are Muslim because father is a Muslim. Now this atheist, he's thinking. He may be coming from a religious background. His father may be pious, but he does not believe that how can they be a God who requires to eat, a God who can die, a God who can lie. So the reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, that there is no God. The only thing I have to do is illallah, but Allah, which I shall do inshallah. So half my job is done to a non-Muslim who believes in some other God, first I have to prove to him that the God is worshipping is wrong. And after I prove to him that the God is worshipping is wrong, then I have to prove to him about the correct God. Here, the atheist, half my job is done. He already agrees in the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do inshallah. The first question asked to the atheist is, that what is the definition of God? If anyone says there is no God, to say there is no God, he should know the definition of God. If he does not know the definition of God, he cannot say there is no God. For example, if I say this is a pen, is this a pen? No. It's a book. To say this is not a pen, you should know the definition of pen. 
Some people say, no, Zakir, I know this is a book, so I can say it's not a pen. I said, no. If you know the definition of pen, I will say, is this a kitab? You say, no, it is not a kitab, because there's no definition of kitab. To say it's not a kitab, you should know the definition of kitab. Because kitab and book is the same. So to say it is not a pen, you have to know the definition of pen. You may or may not know the definition of a book, correct? So similarly, to say there is no God, you should know the definition of God. So now this person who is atheist, he is believing, oh, that God, he requires to eat, he can lie, he fights and he loses. He does not believe in a God. So I say, even I don't believe in such a God. La ilaha. Then I tell to him the correct concept of God. And the correct concept of God is mentioned for a class. Chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which I shall discuss in the last day of the conference, inshallah. And that is on 20th of January. So what he's doing? He is rejecting the false God. Then I ask the question to the atheist, that if suppose there is equipment which is bought in front of you, who no one in the world has ever seen, no one knows about it. And if I ask the question, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of their equipment. The atheist will tell. The first person who will tell the mechanism of this equipment, who no one in the world is seen, it is the creator. Some may say the manufacturer. Some may say the inventor. Some will say the person who has made it, maker. He may say creator, maker, inventor, manufacturer. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Don't grapple with the words. What he says, accept it. Then ask him, then repeat the lecture which I gave, which I don't intend to be reading, that how did the universe come into existence? So he will tell about the Big Bang. Then I'll tell him that when did you come to know? He will tell you in 1973, yesterday in science, 30 years back, 40 years back. I will say what you are talking about the Big Bang you came to know 30 years back is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned it? He will say maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue with him. Continue. What's the shape of the earth? He will tell you, previously people thought it's flat, now we know it's spherical. When did you come to know? He will tell you 1577, when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth. Men, 300 years back, 400 years back, 450 years back. The Quran mentions 14 years ago. Who could have mentioned it? He will say, oh, maybe your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was an intelligent man. Don't argue, continue. Light of the moon is its own light or reflected light? He will tell you previously we thought light of the moon was its own light. Recently we have come to know a couple of hundred years back, it's reflected light. It's mentioned in the Quran, Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 61. Light of the moon is reflected 14 years back. Who could have mentioned it? Now we'll pause. Don't wait for the answer. Continue. In school, I was taught that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its axis. He'll have either mentioned the Quran. I said, no, that's what I learned in school. But the Quran says, the sun and the moon rotate, which we have come to know recently. In school, 25 years back, I was told the sun did not rotate. The Quran says 14 years back that the sun rotates, which science has discovered today. Who could have mentioned that? There'll be a pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. So all the scientific things I mentioned in my talk, after each scientific fact, ask him who could have mentioned it before. And finally, he will tell the creator, the manufacturer the inventor, the maker, this creator, this manufacturer, this producer, this inventor, we in Islam call as Allah. That's the reason today science is not eliminating God, la ilaha, it is eliminating models of God, illallah. Therefore, Sir Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher, he said that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist, in-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. So, with this help of this lecture, Quran, Modern Science, you can prove the existence of God scientifically. Hope that answers the question. Brother, go ahead and state your question. I remind the sisters, inshallah, to motivate those non-Muslim sisters that may be amongst you to ask their questions. This is an excellent opportunity for them. So you should really try to motivate them to come to the microphones. Brother. My name is Ritesh, and I'm a student studying 11th standard. My question is, uh, all the religions have limitations of clothing. Uh, let me be specific to the women. Uh, but they've changed with time. 
but why is the burqa still the same why hasn't that changed with time and uh, one more question uh, i'm sorry uh, during ramzan i've seen all the muslims will be fasting the brother said that by the passage of time every religion has got clothing for women but by the passage of time the clothing keeps on changing but why the muslim women yet wear the burqa as far as the clothing is concerned brother in islam there are six criteria for clothing for the man it's from the navel to the knee that is the extent it should be covered for the woman the complete body should be covered the only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the rest there are certain scholars who say that even this should be covered the remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman the second is the clothes they wear it should not be so tight so that it reveals the figure it should be loose the third is it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through the fourth is it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex fifth it should not resemble that of the unbeliever and sixth it should not resemble that of the opposite sex these are basically the six criteria and most of the six criteria are even mentioned in the other scriptures if you read the bible it's mentioned in the bible in the book of deuteronomy chapter number 22 verse number 5 it says that the woman shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a man and a man shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a woman all those who do this they are creating an abomination it's further mentioned in the bible in the first timothy chapter number 2 verse number 9 that the woman should be dressed up with shamefacedness and sobriety they should not wear costly array pearls and gold and further it's mentioned in the first corinthians chapter number 11 verse number 5 to 6 that the woman that prayeth with the head uncovered her head should be shaved off there is no verse in the quran and the hadith which says that the woman who does not cover her head should be shaved off but the bible is stricter bible is stricter than the quran that if the woman that prays does not cover the head the head should be shaved off the same thing in the hindu scripture if you read the hindu scriptures it's mentioned in ramayan that when pasuram when he comes to ram he says to his wife sita that he the elder therefore lower your gaze and guard your modesty it's so the mention if you read rigved book number 10 chapter number 5 verse number 30 it says that the woman who wears the clothes of that of a man she is defiling it she should not wear the clothes of a man further it's mentioned that in rigved book number 8 that brahma has ordered that the woman should cover her head so in hindu scriptures christian scriptures muslim scriptures modesty is there covering the head is there by the passage of time i do agree with you that christianity now you only see the nuns covering the head they are called pious if muslim women cover their hair they are called as subjugated why double standards if you see a nun covered properly if you see the photograph of mother mary have you seen the photograph of mother mary like a muslima and she was a muslima muslim woman properly covered with the rest only face seen what i do agree with you if you stick to the six criteria by fashion the types of hijab the burqa abaya has changed as long as you follow the six principles of islam and you change the color from black to blue to brown no problem as long as you don't break any of the six criteria therefore you see new new styles of hijab but some styles of burqa they are so fashionable that they break the law of islam there are so many shiny sequences coming that are attracting the opposite sex so that is haram but otherwise you want to wear red you want to wear black color no problem people think black is compulsory black is not compulsory if you wear black maybe you may have to wash the burqa once in a week if you wear white you may have to wash every day the choice is yours you wear white and wash it every day you wear black and wash it once a week choice is yours as long as it doesn't break any of the criteria six criteria of hijab so now there are new types of hijab coming as long as it doesn't break you are allowed but it should be modest if it's modest it's accepted second question that you see in ramadan that people fast when they fast in the day in the evening they feast 
And I would like to thank you for asking this question. So why do we fast? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. You may learn taqwa. And today, scientists tell us, if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. So if you can fast, you can control your other desires. But I do agree with you, if not all, many Muslims, if you say most also, I would not mind agreeing with you, that they fast, and when they break the fast, they feast. So that defeats the purpose, I do agree with you. And many of them convert the day into night and night into day. They sleep the full day, and the full night they're playing cricket. In India, cricket. So you have to lead a normal life, like a normal life, you have to do more ibadah, you have to worship God more. So normally when you fast, but natural, your meals are reduced, it is medically beneficial, but if you overeat, then there'll be a problem. But if you do it the correct way, there are various medical benefits of fasting, which you can refer to my video cassette. And I've given 64 episodes on fasting, which come during Ramadan. And inshallah, you can watch the various benefits of fasting. Hope that answers the question. Sister Side, if you have a question from a non-Muslim sister, could you please state it? Asalaamu Alaikum. This is on behalf of a non-Muslim, Sister Vandana. She says, I'm new to this concept, uh, have limited knowledge, therefore asking a basic question. If out of 6,000 verses, 1,000 are about scientific facts, then what really is the essence of the Quran? The sister asked a very good question, that if the Quran contains more than 6,000 verses, and more than a thousand speak about science, what is the essence of the Quran? Sister, as I mentioned in my earlier answer, the basic essence of the Quran is Tawheed. Believing in one God and worshipping Him alone and no one else. And the Quran, as I mentioned, is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. -S. It's a book of ayats. The Quran is a book which shows you how a life should be led. And when I had a debate with Shishi Ravi Shankar, I said, this is the best book on art of living. If there is any book on art of living which is the best, it is the Quran. Best book on art of living. And it has a membership of more than 1.3 billion people. So this book shows you how to lead a life. Now, many a time you understand that because the Quran is the word of Almighty God, one verse of the Quran has got multiple angles. Now, the same thousand verses which are speaking about science, it doesn't mean it only speaks about science. It speaks about various other aspects also. That's the beauty of the Quran. When a layman sees it, he understands it. When a scientific man sees it, he sees it at a different angle. It satisfies both. So that's the beauty of the Quran. That does not mean the Quran is the book of science. Yes, but there is not a single verse of the Quran which goes against established science. Because it's a book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. So this book is a book of guidance how a life should be led. It shows a person to believe in oneness of God, how to worship Him, and how to lead the life. The pros and cons. The faraiz, what a human being should do, and the prohibited things that you should abstain from. It's mentioned in the Quran. Hope that answers the question, Sister. Sister, if you have another question, go ahead, if it's from a non-Muslim. Your presentation is an impressive, but could you just ask this group to raise their hands? Who knew some of the information that you mentioned now? The thought here is, why is general education and the learning of the Holy Quran not integrated? Sister has a question that from the audience, how many of you knew the major portion of what I've said in the lecture? Please raise your hand. Major portion of what I've mentioned, mashallah, you can say most of them, at least more than 50%, if not all. And the reason is that I've written a book also, Quran and Modern Science, Compatible and Compatible, which has been distributed in the conference. If those who have not got a copy, inshallah, on your way out, the copy of my talk, Quran and Modern Science, will be distributed, inshallah. It's a four-color book. Regarding the part of the question, the second part, 
that why isn't education been given to the Muslims? So I expected the sister would have thought that maybe 1% or 10%, less than 10% raised the hand. So here you see, mashallah, majority knew it. And yet they came for the talk, alhamdulillah. Maybe they came for the question answer session. That is the best part of the program. Sister, as far as Islam is concerned, the first guidance given by Almighty God in the glorious Quran, in the last and final revelation of the human beings, it was not to offer salah. It was not to perform hajj or pilgrimage. It was ikra, read, recite, proclaim. So the first guidance given by Almighty God in the last and final revelation, it was to read, it was education. And that the reason the major stress that the Muslims should put is on education. And Alhamdulillah, the people of the South, I know from Kerala and even of Madras, MashaAllah, of Chennai, as far as the percentage is concerned in the other parts of India, Alhamdulillah, the Muslims in Kerala are 100% educated. Not Muslims, all Keralites, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, they're educated. So even culture counts into it. As far as the religion of Islam is concerned, every Muslim, he should be educated. So that's the message for those who are not educated, that acquiring education is important. And that is the first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran. Hope that answers the question. If the sister could please stay at the microphone, I'll come back to you after I take a question from the gentleman's side, if you have more questions from non-Muslims. If there's another sister who has a question, non-Muslim, then please allow her to come to the mic and ask her question as well. But until then, I'll go with the brother in the front. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, it was amazing to see how much uh, science that the glorious Quran contained after your talk. But in most of the examples from the Quran which you gave, it is very difficult to comprehend what the Quran tells before actually the science discovers or invents that particular phenomenon. For example, you said, in the honey, there is healing of humanity in the Quran. And you mentioned it as it's about if a person is maybe say poisoned with a plant, the honey of the plant should be taken. So what is the use, say, of a almighty holy scripture talking about things which you are only able to comprehend after the real invention is made by science? So can you tell me now something from the Quran which will be invented by science later or yet to be invented? Brother, that's a very good question that I've mentioned many things about science indirectly saying all this was already discovered earlier. And if Quran says something and after science has discovered, so what's the use? Can you tell me something which science hasn't discovered? Brother, that's the reason the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. Why? Because they read the Quran. The Quran has a lot of information on astronomy. So when they read the Quran, they try and do more investigation. They do more research. And that's how they come to know. Quran is a telegraphic message. See, the book of science, only on one subject. In medicine, one subject only requires volumes. So if that way the Quran is, this Quran, most of the human beings, they don't like to read. Oh, such a big book. So if God Almighty wrote in detail, then even a big building, you will require thousands of buildings to contain the message of the Quran. Quran is telegraphic message. So in telegraphic message, many of the Muslims, they read the Quran and they made advances in science. That's the reason we find, if you go back into history, the Muslims advanced in science and technology. But you pose the question, forget about the past. What about today? All what I've mentioned has been discovered earlier, but many of them were discovered by Muslims. Some by non-Muslims, some by Europeans. What about things which science hasn't discovered? Fine. First, I'll tell you those things which science hasn't established, but yet there are high chances, which Quran has testified, and I believe in it. For example, Quran says in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 29, that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the creatures in the heavens and the earth and has placed creatures in them. So Quran says there is life besides this earth. Today science hasn't proved there is life besides this earth. Scientists say there are high possibilities that life will be there besides this earth. So they're sending rockets, spaceships, moon, Mars. Quran says there's life besides this earth. I believe in it. Science may discover it tomorrow, after five years, after 10 years, after 100 years. Quran says, I believe in it. Today, there are many hypotheses. 
how the world will end. It says that the sun will become big and the world will end. The mountains will fall down. The mountains will become smooth. The ocean will swell up. The world will enter into a black hole. Many hypotheses. Many of these hypotheses, not all, they match with the Quran. Quran says in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 8 and 9, that the sun and the moon, they will join together. The sun will be buried in darkness. If it's Surah Takhvir, chapter number 81, verse number 1, 2, and 3, it says that the stars will fall down and lose their luster. The mountains will fall down to utter ruin. The ocean will swell up. It's mentioned in Surah Infitar, chapter number 82, verse number 1 and 2 and 3. Again, the ocean will swell up. The stars will fall down. Similar to many of the hypotheses. But Quran says, I believe in it. Quran further says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 104, we have created this creation, we will destroy it and create a new creation. Science hasn't discovered that yet. Quran speaks about life after death. Science hasn't proved that yet. Quran speaks about heaven and hell. Science hasn't proved about that. Quran speaks about jinn. Today, psychologists say, extraterrestrial power. There are some people who get possessed with jinns. Quran speaks about that. Quran speaks the first man on the earth, while Adam, peace be upon him. Science hasn't proved. There are high possibilities science will prove. Now, you may ask me, that brother, Zakir, you gave such a good talk on science and technology with 100% solid proof. You believe in life after death? You believe in jinn? You believe in heaven and hell? You a doctor? Isn't this unscientific? I said, no, brother. I believe that it is scientific. Suppose whatever the Quran has mentioned, 80% has proved to be 100% correct. I spoke about astronomy, about geology, water cycle, oceanography, botany, biology, zoology. So just hypothetically, 80% what the Quran has mentioned, suppose, has been proved to be 100% correct. The remaining 20% is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. Not even 0.1% of that 20% which is ambiguous has been proved to be wrong. There is not a single verse of the Quran which can be proved false by established science. Hypothesis. So my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and the remaining 20% is ambiguous, but not even 0.1% of that 20% is proved wrong. So my logic says that even that 20% inshallah will be correct. If not today, tomorrow, after 50 years, after 100 years, after 1000 years, Allah alam, God knows, they will prove there is life after death. They will prove there is jinn. They will prove there is hell. There is proof there is heaven, and so on and so forth. I can give another lecture on things which science hasn't proved, but inshallah will prove. Hope that answers the question. Thank you for the question. Sister Side, if you have another question from a non-Muslim sister, could you please state it? Uh, this is the last question from Sister Vandana. Your memory and grasping is phenomenal. Is there any mention about better memory power? Sister asked the question that my memory is phenomenal through the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there any verse in the Quran which speaks about memory? As far as people keep on asking me that what is the secret? Do you have a computer chip? What's the secret? The secret, it is given in the Quran. And in my Dawa training program, which I take for my students, I say there are three things required. Number one, the Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 160, that if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put the trust in Allah. Number one is trust in Allah. Number two, the Quran says in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you struggle and do jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up your pathways. Number two is hard work. And number three is, Allah says in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, Verse number seven. And Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 43. First, Alu Ahal is Zikri in Kumdulat Alamun. If you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. The third is the technique. The technique which we train in our Dawa training program. People ask me, Mr. Zakir, what is the technique? 
I tell you that's the third and the least important. Number one is faith in Allah. With all your techniques in the world. You know, many of my students have done MBA and memorizing technique, triangle and horse. I don't know whether you know about the triangle technique and this and that and pegging. Initially, they are good students. Towards the end, they come at the bottom. Allah's help is the best, better than any pegging or any triangle, anything. Number one. How do you get Allah's help? If you strive in His way. You strive in His way, you have to get success. If you don't get success, you are not striving correctly in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding technique of memory, etc., that is least important. We have a training course where we have a 40 days training course where we train people. And mashallah, you'll be shocked that even my students, alhamdulillah, they quote chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number. We have our training program where we get students from different parts of the world and we train them in how to give lectures, how to handle question answer session. It's training and hard work also. As far as the verse of the Quran is concerned, before the beginning of my talk, I always quote a verse of the Quran from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 and 28, which says, Rabbi Shuhali Sadri. This was a dua when Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tells to Moses that go and deliver the message. And before delivering the message, Moses, who was a stutterer, he used to stammer. And those who know me personally, even I was a stammerer when I was a child. And in my dream, a person can dream of anything in the world. In my dream, I could have dreamt of becoming the best surgeon in the world. But I couldn't have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Because I was a stammerer. People ask me, what is your name? I said, my name is Adha, 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 Adha. That was me. Now, coming in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe about 10, 15 years back when I got involved in the field of Dawah, when I started doing Dawah, stammering wasn't there. When I spoke with Christian missionaries, stammering used to vanish. I never thought of becoming a speaker. I came on the stage because my colleague was cold feet. I came, it clicked, and now I'm on the stage. And now by Allah's grace, I give lectures to tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. The largest gathering is a million people live, alhamdulillah. That comes back to the verse of the Quran. When Moses was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver the message to Pharaoh and his people, he read a dua, a dua, a prayer from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 to 28, which says, Rabbish Hali Sadri, O my Lord, expand my breast for me. Expand my center for me. Rabbi Shuhali Sadri. Vayasilli Amri. And make my task easy for me. Rabbi Shuhali Sadri. Vayasilli Amri. Wahalul Ugdata Millesan Yafkav Kauli. And remove the impediment from my speech. Because Musa alayhi salam was a stammerer. I also was a stammerer. Remove the impediment from my speech so that they will understand me. So the people to whom I'm delivering the message. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expand my breath for me, to make my task easy for me, remove the impediment from my speech so that the people will understand me. So this is a dua which can also be used for memory. But the main is having faith in Allah, second is striving hard, and third is technique. Hope that answers the question. That will be the last question for the evening. And with that, we would like to end this, the second night of the 10-day international conference and exhibition brought to you by Peace, Vision of Islam for Harmony, Awareness, and Education. Jazakallah khair for your attendance.